Welcome to the second day of the Solar Conference. Uh, the conference we are about to begin with is financing and RE projects, de-risking utility scale renewables financing, and enhancing access to finance for unreserved segments. So first of all, I would like to take the pleasure of calling our respected moderator on the stage, Mr. Shantanu Jaiswal, Head of Indian Research, Bloomberg, New Energy Finance India. So maybe please, can we have a round of applause, please? Thank you. For the special address, I would like to call Mrs. Rajeshree Ray, Economic Advisor, Department of Economic Affairs, Ministry of Finance, Government of India. For the industry presentation, we have Mr. Vikas Bansal. Can we please have sir, you, sir? Now let me call on stage our esteemed speakers, Dr. Ashok Haldia, MD and CEO, PTC India, Financial Services Limited. Dr. Donald Cannon, Head, Regional Representation, European Investment Bank. Mr. Sujoy Ghosh, Country Head, India, First Solar Power, India, Private Limited. Mr. Ronald Sastravan, Senior Risk Analyst, Munishari, Hong Kong. Mr. Manu Agarwal, Program Associate, Council on Energy, Environment and Water. I would request uh, Mr. Shantanu Jaswal to open the conference. Thank you very much. And uh, very good morning to you all over here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope the ride over here to Prakriti Madan wasn't too difficult for you early in the morning today. And uh, so today's session is on financing. Financing, uh, you know, it has never been easy for whatever uh, project or whatever uh, intention you, that you may have. And uh, similar is the case with renewables in India. I mean, uh, there have been changing parameters, changing policies, and uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, you know innovations happening on the technology side as well. And that has led to significant and continuous changes in the financing environment. And that is exactly what we are trying to discuss over here. We'll be, we have a very diverse panel, as you can see, and uh, as was just introduced uh, a while ago. We have people from different areas and having different backgrounds. So I hope it would be an interesting session. And the way we're going to do uh, go about this session today is that we're going to have a uh, uh, deliverance by uh, Ms. Rajshree over here, first of all, and then we'll have a Q&A session with the panelists, and then I'll open the floor for any questions that uh, you may have. So uh, I would like to invite Ms. Rajshree first, and uh, ma'am, over to you. Thank you, Shandanu, and very good morning to all. Um, uh, and thanks for the organizers for this opportunity. I'm very much delighted to be here uh, to uh, in this uh, in, in this one mega event. This organized by the ITPO. In fact, it has become uh, any uh, it has become an important event and occupy, uh, occupying a prominent place in the uh, in the national events and. Uh, providing that direction uh, to the uh, to the uh, s s sustainability I issues so when we talk about the renewable energy sector in india the the growth uh, the the story the, uh, the the story has been remarkable uh, uh, from adding a few megawatts in the early part of the uh, early part of the decade uh, the sector has now become a dominant uh, source of capacity uh, power capacity addition and uh, uh, the what is noteworthy is that uh, that majority of this capacity addition has taken place in the last four, four to five five years. And uh, in fact, in 2017-18, if you look at the data, the renewable capacity addition that exceeded of the uh, of the conventional power power sources and uh, there are uh, there are uh, studies which indicate that there is a good pipeline of projects uh, for us to uh, to achieve another 21 gigawatt of installed renewable energy capacity by uh, by 2019 
So there are various examples which we can see if you look at the policy frameworks, uh, and that has helped in larger scale implementation and uh, replication of practices. And uh, surely, renewable energy is uh, renewable energy is uh, is one area which we can easily talk in, in this regard. So. <clears throat> And the kind of success which we have seen in the renewable energy sector in the uh, in the last decade, or in particular in the last four to five years, we can see that it is it has been made possible uh, to a large extent also because of the commitment uh, and the uh, uh, and the determination which uh, which government has all uh, has also shown uh, in this regard. And if we look at the broad uh, energy uh, policy of the government, it, uh, it aims to provide access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy services to all. Uh, so yes, uh, while the while renewable energy, the importance given to renewable energy has always been there, it has got a huge boost because of the international developments also, especially with the adoption of the uh, post uh, post uh, uh, 2015 development agenda in the form of. Uh, adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals in September 2015, and we do have uh, the uh, SDG 7, which talks about, uh, which talks uh, specifically about the access to modern energy services to all, and of course with the adoption of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change in December uh, 2015, and the fact that, uh, fact that uh, uh, the Paris Agreement has been ratified by. Uh, 176 countries so far. We do have 170. Globally, if we look at the direction of travel which is coming from the Paris Agreement, globally we do have 170, uh, uh, 170 nationally determined contributions, which means the Paris Climate Change Pledge by 170 countries. So nationally determined contributions, uh, India also uh, has a nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement. And it talks about uh, uh, cumulative electric power capacity from known fossil fuels, that is the fourth. It has a few quantitative targets, uh, the, uh, India's nationally determined contributions. And one of the quantitative targets which we have taken is that 40% of the cumulative electric power capacity coming from non fossil fuel uh, based energy resources. So clearly, there is a uh, there is a direction of travel from the domestic uh, uh, domestic policy framework. Uh, so, the, uh, if uh, if we look at the climate story, I, I'm more uh, uh, comfortable in talking about cli uh, uh, climate story because that is what I deal with uh, deal with in the government, the climate and sustainable development agenda. So, the climate story, when we look at it, it is incomplete without the story of what the uh, uh, story of the renewable energy sector, and there is a kind of convergence you can see both at the uh, uh, domestic level and the international global development agenda. There is a convergence between the, uh, our domestic uh, policy, uh, domestic development agenda and the international development agenda, both in the form of SDGs and the Paris uh, uh, and the Paris agree Agreement. And uh, since we have taken some ambitious targets under the climate uh, uh, climate pledge, the uh, the, uh, the steps have been taken. The initial steps have been taken uh, in the form of scaled renewable energy uh, targets to 175 gigawatt by 2022. So that that has already been announced, and the government and the stakeholders, uh, most importantly the private sector, is working very hard. Uh, to achieve that 175 gigawatt by 2022. 20, uh, <coughs> and at the sa same time, government is putting in place a, a conducive policy framework uh, that will enable the country to achieve these targets which we have put it on the table uh, uh, internationally to deliver on commitments especially with regard to climate uh, climate change uh, uh, commitments which we have taken there there is a roadmap which is being developed at the uh, 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 at the national level uh, through an implementation committee and various subcommittees constituted to 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 uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, work on that and subcommittee on mitigation subcommittee on technology subcommittee on funds all of these are working and subcommittee on mitigation definitely is uh, uh, is uh, talking and discussing much about the renewable energy sector how renewable energy sector is going to contribute to achieve this uh, this target so when we talk about the facilitative policy in uh, environment one can see that the yes government has lent its support uh, to the renewable energy sector firstly in the form of 
the much of it, the uh, capacity addition which we can see that is coming from the uh, national solar mission it is a mission under the national action plan on climate change and uh, this program has been a key driver if we look at uh, uh, the solar capacity addition and there was uh, there was support in, uh, from the government side in the form of viability uh, viability gap funding under the national solar mission which is a mission it's a, uh, it's one among the eight missions under the national action plan on climate change meanwhile in the case of wind energy also we can see that there has been uh, uh, there has been uh, the support uh, largely uh, in the form of incendies, uh, uh, accelerated depreciation and, ge gen uh, and generation-based incendi uh, incendies. And of course, uh, over the years, uh, dynamic adjustments have been done in the, uh, in, uh, in the renewable energy segment, and uh, uh, competitive bidding process have been introduced, and because of which we could see that aggressive uh, uh, bidding taking place, and uh, the, which resulted in the uh, re reduction of prices say, of both solar and wind. And we uh, we saw a very uh, very aggressive kind of price discovery happening in the last uh, last one year or one and a half year. So uh, when we, when if I if I can elaborate a little more about the kind of incentives which are in place for the uh, for, for for the renewable energy sector, if we talk about FDI, it is uh, it is 100% allowed uh, in the renewable energy sector. It's a part of the priority sector lending uh, norms by the commercial banks uh, as far as the renewable energy sector is concerned. Uh, concerned. And in 2016, we could see that the industry transmission charges paid by solar and wind power projects awarded to competitive bidding were waived off to bring down the cost for developers. And if if I further if I can further mention, so to improve the ease of doing business, renewable energy has been put under the put under the white category, which means that the environment clearances from the government and the consent from the the state pollution uh, uh, control boards that uh, that is not required if if it is put it in the white white, uh, white category. So these are the ma major uh, uh, major programs and incentives as far as the uh, as far as the from the government side and the public sector side is concerned and the domestic policy front but we, when we look at the uh, yes domestic policy front we do have various measures and, and policies in place but at the same time uh, india has played a, a major role uh, globally also especially for the promotion of uh, promotion of solar and during the uh, uh, on the sidelines of the paris agreement negotiations uh, 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 in 2015, uh, uh, India, uh, along with uh, France, uh, uh, set up the uh, set up the uh, International Solar Alliance for the promotion of solar energy. Uh, solar energy, and subsequently, the foundation stone. Was, and uh, there is a journey so far uh, happened in the case of International Solar Alliance. It has uh, it, it has come into force. So, uh, even at the global uh, level, uh, uh, India has played a very constructive role for the promotion of uh, promotion of solar energy and if if we look at the uh, uh, investment opportunities which is solar which renewable energy sector uh, uh, provides uh, uh, there are various estimates even in the uh, uh, Paris Climate Pledge by India in the form of nationally determined contributions. There are various estimates available, but I would like to quote here one uh, one uh, one report from the IFC, International Finance Corporation. It is a report, uh, talking, uh, 2017 report on climate investment opportunities in South Asia. Uh, that, sta uh, that states that. Uh, uh, 3.1 trillion uh, dollar climate investment opportunity will arise in India between 2018 and 2030 if it has to fulfill the uh, uh, nationally determined economy, if it has to fulfill the uh, Paris Agreement or climate pledge. And uh, uh, there are various uh, sectors uh, identified uh, for the investment, uh, investment requirements to achieve that uh, uh, climate pledge. And renewable energy is one among them, which, which represents almost uh, 404 billion investment potential. That is what that IFC, uh, IFC report has, uh, has uh, mentioned. So, 
so that is the kind of potential which uh, we, which we should be looking out so uh, if we have to have action in the right direction we need to definitely uh, definitely address the range of barriers and impediments that are existing and yes the this session talking about the financing and de-risking uh, financing has been an important challenge in realizing the ambitious uh, plans that we uh, that we have uh, if from a climate change perspective uh, government has uh, tried with uh, uh, tried with a, a mix careful mix of both market mechanism, fiscal incentives, uh, fiscal instruments, and regulatory measures, and all, in all these things, private sector has a very important uh, role to uh, role to play. And the affordable financing, the cost of borrowing, uh, uh, and access to long-term uh, affordable finance, that has been a, a very key factor, and uh, uh, it is a key determinant of generation cost for renewables. So uh, that, that uh, if that has to happen, that, that needs to be addressed, and if private sector, uh, that potential and the uh, and private sector, if it has to come forward, we need to we need to present renewable energy investment as a less uh, risky uh, proposition, and. Uh, uh, we need to address that issue. It's still, uh, it is still in comparative terms. It is, uh, it is large, and it is uh, acting as a kind of barrier. The uh, the cost of uh, cost of financing. So, uh, from the government side again, yes, it has uh, laid down the policy directions which all we need to travel. Uh, so that itself is giving a certain kind of uh, uh, certainty uh, about the road ahead and a kind of confidence which we which we uh, we have. One example is that. Uh, uh, the, how, that uh, how uh, we are trying to address the offtake risk, and uh, uh, that uh, especially I would like to mention the Uday scheme here, which is trying to improve the financial uh, 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 financial situ uh, state of the uh, of the discoms. So yes, policy uh, framework is important, but equally equally important is the role of the financing uh, fi financing community, and we need to develop that uh, that uh, innovative financing instruments to help de-risk investment. I'm sure uh, my uh, panelists here will be definitely uh, uh, delving into it uh, in much more detail, uh, much more detail. I would just like to mention a few points, and I would like to conclude thereafter. So one uh, one uh, uh, public sector agency which has worked uh, in this uh, renewable energy space is the IRIDA with credit enhancement uh, with credit enhancement schemes issuing letter of comfort loans against uh, securitization these are the kind of financial structures which uh, which uh, which are being talked about and IRIDA has uh, uh, worked in that uh, in that specific uh, uh, space uh, and uh, there is a, there is a scheme by IRIDA called Access to Energy Projects, uh, which provides financing to off-grid renewable uh, energy pro uh, projects with first loss mechanism under a KFW line of credit. <laughs> so there are examples which which are there, and there are examples from Renew Wind and Hindustan Power also. I'm sure uh, my panelists will definitely get into the uh, get into the details of it. Uh, so banks and non-banking financial companies primarily ha has um has funded uh, the renewable energy. But of late, we can see that infrastructure debt funds, that also started coming up and playing an active uh, active role. Uh, I would like to mention specifically about the green bonds, which is uh, which is a very much a part of the uh, part of the climate finance uh, uh, discussions and negotiations. This is the, not only in the multilateral climate change regime, this particular uh, concept is being talked about, but in the G20 also, this is a very important agenda which is being talked about. And if we look at the green bonds, India has uh, 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 has played a very impressive uh, impressive role. Uh, SEBI in 2016 come, uh, came out with uh, uh, the guidelines for, for, th uh, for that. And yes, uh, we have uh, Yes Bank representative here. Yes Bank has been one of the pioneers in that, and other uh, Exim Bank, Irida, IDB, and Axis Bank. They all have come out with uh, successful uh, 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 have come out successfully uh, in the in the green bonds. I, if I can quote a Moody's report, uh, it it uh, Moody's report states that green bond issuance in India has touched almost uh, 6.5 billion dollar. And further, it says that global green bond issuances are likely to a uh, to reach 
250 billion dollar this year in which india as uh, india is leading as an emerging uh, uh, player so uh, the growth of green bonds definitely is a testimony to the uh, to the and much of these green bonds is in the uh, in the uh, in the area of renewable energy so there is uh, an increasing confidence which we can see as far as the renewable energy sector is concerned so uh, yes, these are the uh, uh, these are the uh, developments happening, uh, especially in the policy space, and uh, there are various financial structures which are coming to de uh, uh, to de-risk investment. Uh, the one opportunity which I would like to put uh, to the table is the uh, is the uh, opportunity given by the Green Climate Fund. When the whole world sees climate change as a big challenge and various sectors are finding it very difficult to take actions and adapt to the adverse impacts on climate change. So for various sectors like agriculture, water, it's a challenge. And look at the conventional power sector, coal. It is a big challenge. Climate change is coming as a big challenge for that conventional power sector. But one sector which can really claim that, yes, it is an opportunity that is the renew uh, it is a renewable energy sector. For renewable energy sector, climate change is coming as an opportunity. So, And there are various uh, uh, financial mechanisms in place in the climate uh, policy space. Uh, uh, one is the dedicated climate fund, that is the Green Climate Fund. Uh, and it has a, it has a special program uh, for Private, called private sector facility, uh, which uh, which uh, aims to promote the participation of the private sector in developing countries. So that has, it is a specialized program. And uh, if we look at the uh, progress of the fund, it has uh, it has achieved considerable uh, progress. And if you look at the GCF portfolio so far, uh, how many projects it has been approved? Uh, GCF uh, Green Climate Fund it has approved 76 projects so far in the last few years uh, since its operationalization uh, and 40% of those uh, those uh, projects are from the private sector and uh, 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 for this 40% of the projects out of the 76 projects uh, 800 million gcf funding has been uh, has been approved and the beauty of that those private sector projects are that it is it it, it, it allows uh, there is a power of, of leveraging and co-financing here uh, this 800 million uh, gcf funding uh, brings to the table around uh, f uh, five times more in terms of co-financing these projects. So, uh, so this is an opportunity which is coming uh, to the private to the country as a whole, uh, to, to the especially to the private sector. And what we have achieved out of these 76 projects, we have we have got two projects out of these 76 projects. And if you look at we, we, many small small countries have uh, have received, but. India is a large country, but we have received only two projects so far. And one is a public sector project, and another is a private sector project. And that private sector project is on the off-grid solar rooftop uh, in the industrial and commercial sector. So this particular private sector project has agreed to provide 100 million line of credit to Tata Clean Tech. So that, ha that this project was approved in the last meeting, which was held in February. So, so yes, there is an opportunity. It has a lot of uh, a, a lot of leveraging power. So, uh, it's an opportunity which the private sector definitely need to look into it and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, try to bring concrete projects. Of course, you, you can always uh, uh, document the thing through uh, energy access uh, and kind of things. But in order to uh, uh, receive funding from a dedicated climate fund we need to con uh, in concrete terms we need to bring the additionality in terms of climate change benefits whether uh, uh, either through the mitigation aspects or the uh, adaptation aspects so uh, uh, i conclude by saying yes we do have a kind of uh, a, a commitment on the table as a country and there we find the direction of travel which we need to uh, which we need to uh, uh, move and um, and whatever we achieve, it's a sum total of all public sector, government, and the private sector. So uh, it's a, if a country has a commitment, it's the sum total of all the actors uh, 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 which, uh, which, uh, deliver, uh, which deliver on that commitment. So 
I think I stop here and um, I wish uh, success for this event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. That was a very comprehensive description of uh, what's happening in India in terms of climate change targets, long-term policies, the incentives that have been provided, the role of various uh, agencies, whether it's banks or whether it's private players, uh, and as well as the international community and how financing is coming to Indian projects. <coughs> so thank you very much for that. And uh, I would like to now begin the discussion uh, amongst the panelists. And I would first of all like to bring Dr. Haldia into the discussion. And uh, it's a very simple, a very short question for you, sir, is uh, what are your observations in the Indian industry, in the renewable industry? You know, being a veteran, you have seen the industry go through many cycles. And uh, just in last year, I believe the solar cycle, the solar industry has gone through one complete cycle in just 2017. So I want to understand what are your views on it and uh, are we heading into the right direction? First, thank you very much. And I was indeed impressed by the size of these exhibitions and the kind of products those are on displays. So compliments to the organizers. Uh, the solar and the renewables, we have been in this business. We are a financial institution and having financed so far more than 150 projects, both in the solar and the wind in the country and all over the country. We are in the business since 2009 and 10. We were possibly the first of the institution to start lending to the solar. And I remember uh, we had a, a, a grueling time inside the institution as to why and how we should finance the solar projects with an IRR as per our calculations less than, less than 3% or 4%. But we thought that the times to come would be for the renewables and the energy mix and in the energy mix renewable is going to play a major role in the country. We positioned ourselves and we were the first of the institution in the country to start lending to the solar projects. And as the, as the development of the solar power industry moved forward, we became one of the prominent institution in the country to do so. And in the last seven years, we have seen so many developments, the turnarounds, the transformation taking place in this industry from all perspective. And possibly if you, if you compare solar industry with any other industry, and the kind of changes that have transformation that have taken place in this industry, you will find that the other industry would have taken 25, 30 years to witness those transformations. Just think about, in the beginning we have a solar power project, 5 megawatts, then 10 megawatts. And some, 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 uh, the bank, some institutions or the corporates setting up the solar project for the tax advantage. Then after some time came a new creed of a professionals who thought of setting up the smaller solar power projects with the, with the funding support of the private players, maybe some private equity players. And then we saw the size of the solar power project increasing to 25 to 50 megawatts. And there is a transformation taking place on the entrepreneur side. Instead of the, uh, the entrepreneurs or the developers setting up the projects for tax benefits or, or as an alternative source of energy or as an alternative investment, it, it became a main, main stay of the investment decisions. It became the main stay of the energy security mix in the country. We, we witnessed the number of private equity players, the large private equity players, backing those, uh, those, those technocrats professionals to having taken initiatives to set up the solar or the renewable power projects. And then we saw the 50 megawatts and 100 megawatts, and now the government is thinking more than 200 megawatts. We saw the development of solar park. We witnessed the government support in by, by all means, as, as Ms. Ray has pointed out so comprehensively. Now, so many transformations have taken place. There was plain vanilla products funding the solar power projects, the, the, the normal project financing, and then came the structure product, the bridge financing, the, the financing for the implementation, uh, imp during the implementation phase of the project to bridge up the timing gap in the availability of the fund and also the quantum, uh, the, the quantity gap in the availability of the funds. So a lot of, a lot of transformation have taken place in this industry. 
And as we move forward, the government policies the which were support oriented and the development oriented also became more competitive oriented. The, the, the government started encouraging the competition for the benefit of the consumers and the, for the benefit of the for the uh, benefit of the sector. So an element of market competitiveness entered into the sector and that bring in lot, huge advantages to the consumers and also for the growth of the sector. Whether to what extent this has been led by the market competitions in terms of the competitive forces and this has not yet been led by the technological innovations in the marketplace. So the price reduction, tariff reduction that we are seeing is because of the competitive factors and not because of the technological factors. And if the prices are today 2 rupees 50 paisa or 2 rupees 44 paisa, which have now slightly increased to 3 rupees, I am sure with the technological innovation take place, those would go below 2 rupees. And today, in the yesterday years, we used to think 15 rupees is not viable, the solar power project is not viable. And today, we are debating that the 2 rupees 47 paisa is no more viable. So the question of viability continues to hover around the solar power, uh, solar power projects. But as a lender, we have, always, we have always believed that it is not the tariff, the low or high, that, that makes the project riskier. It is the ecosystem around the project in terms of the promoter, in terms of the project, in terms of the project logistic that makes the project riskier. To us, a 2 rupee 44 uh, uh, PESA bid is as, as viable as a 50 rupees per unit uh, tariff project. Because you have to look at the, if your all risks are mitigated, if you have placed a firm order for supply of the plant and equipments, and if you have you have procured the lands, land, and there is no third party counter risk. I mean, third party counter risk. For example, in the Riva project in the MP, why not two rupees forty paisa is equally profitable? And for us as a lender, we believe we are able to recover our debt and the interest servicing. But then this leave very thin margin to the developer to play with the vagaries of the ecosystem. So one has to be very sure that these kinds of projects are fully risk mitigated. And if there are partial risk mitigated, there is enough provision in the project and enough, enough capacity of the promoter to absorb those risks. Now going forward, today we have seen about 50 gigawatts of the renewables. We, we, we aim to go to 175. And I believe with the impetus that the government has been giving, uh, to, by 2022, we should reach to something around uh, 150 or 100, 120 to 150 gigawatts. Having said that, the last year has not been that growth in the, in the, in the renewables for the various regions. And this year, we hope that the number of bids would come. The earlier, the state governments were taking a lot of initiatives and we saw the number of bids from the state governments coming in. But now, those are waning away, those are drying up. Now more focus is on the central government PSUs uh, floating those, uh, those bids. There were a lot of uncertainties around the power projects in terms of the PPAs, in terms of the discoms, uh, uh, trying to renegotiate or trying to, re, uh, trying to going back from the PPAs. Now those all have settled down and we as an institution, financial institution have play, played a great role in seeing that the states do behave in a manner that safeguards the financial risk of the, of the power projects. I would believe uh, that in the times to come, uh, there would be more market-oriented market focus coming to the renewable power developments. The developers, and particularly the MNCs, are now focusing on the third-party PPA rather than the DISCOM. I still believe that the discoms is, is a better bet than the private power players because in the discoms there is a risk of delay but there is no risk of denial. In case of a third private party being a third party, you have a both risk of delay as well as denial. And that risk, that leads to a larger question that if you are having a private, private party as a third party, what way you have a commercial arrangement fortified the commercial risk so what I, I would feel is in the times to come, there would be more third party uh, uh, oriented PPAs and then the ecosystem also being designed to see that those third party PPA 
are relatively risk free uh, are relatively risk free as a financial institution i would say it's a it is not a lenders market anymore it's a it's a borrowers market a good borrower and a good project is able to get the credit at the interest rate that he wants in the uh, at the commercial terms that he wants going forward you need 6 lakhs crore for 100 gigawatt additional do we have that 600 uh, do we have that 600 lakh crores i believe we do not have we do not have the institutions having that breadth and depth to support that 6 lakh crores we do not have a financing products to support that the commercial banks people largely rely on they do not have the capacity they and the the the, the infrastructure lending is not in their dna and so therefore there is a need for a different kind of institution the specialized institutions the infrastructure finance company was the concept evolved and we lobbied hard with the government of india the ministry of finance to see that the ifc do takes a shape and a shape which an alternative to the commercial banking in the country that is, that concept is started well but again lost somewhere and the focus shifts again to the commercial banking so what we need is a different kind of institutions and new finance new kind of financing products which can cater to a specific requirements of the solar power industries thank you thank you very much sir that was uh, again a good round up of what we have experienced in the past year and uh, so i'll move on to sujay for now and sujay two things uh, catch my mind uh, right now first one is that it's turning the market currently is turning out to be a borrowers market and not a lenders market anymore and secondly there are a lot of concerns and mr haldia also pointed out uh, regarding the tariffs uh, you know going so low without accounting for all the risks so w- what do you think you know are there any concerns with the quality of the assets and the extreme low biddings currently and w- yeah share your views on that okay uh, uh, thanks uh, and thank you to uh, ei group for uh, inviting me to this uh, panel uh, you know while tariffs are going low wholesale tariffs uh, are going low because you've got competitive bidding the retail tariff which a average consumer like me and you are paying is actually going high and i think so uh, you know while we remain fixated on discovering the price for generation there should be a focus on discovering how do you mitigate how do you how does this flow through to the end consumer and you know there is a, given the way the market is structured currently there is a contradiction inherent contradiction and i think that's the larger uh that's the elephant in the room uh, if i may say so uh for the overall power sector and, and i think unless we fix that at some level uh you will probably uh we'll keep debating on these risks of of you know financing uh incremental generation capacity but having said that i think uh, there is a very intense uh, churn going on in the market around uh cost of energy or cost of projects versus reliability and you know right now uh in the apps the way the current tender process is structured you are having very low entry barriers with a very thinly defined specification and you're discovering pricing right now when the thermal power sector or the transmission sector evolved in india uh institutions like power grid and tpc uh they had they evolved with a very well defined quality uh you know quality assurance uh culture and 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 processes and systems and i think what's missing in the solar sector generally and specifically in india is we lack a system to assess the conformity to the quality standards right so we are defining you know there's one page definition in the in the tender around what are the minimum iec standards which uh, a developer must adhere to for procuring components what is missing is how are you ensuring that the developer is conforming to those standards right and i think uh, you know there is uh initiatives going on worldwide led by institutions like the IEC RE uh so this is the IEC renewable energy uh committee which is actually developing those kind of conformity assessment standards which would then help lenders financiers institutions 
to really audit all the way through the life cycle of the project and beyond. I mean, you're looking not just at building the plant and getting the first you know, kilowatt on the grid, but you're looking at a 25-year uh, long-term PP, and so how do you guarantee uh, generation coming in uh, on those lives? So I think uh, you know, uh, it will be uh, pertinent for MNRE and the stakeholders like Seki who are designing these tenders to start including uh, you know, a, a conformity assessment into the RFS plus also have a better definition of certain minimum uh, specifications. We've just taken IEC and just put it uh, into the tender. Uh, we are starting to evolve uh, Indian equivalent standards for key components. But I think, uh, you know, how do you uh, approach construction? How do you look at labor? How do you look at waste disposal? Uh, you know, those are elements which are completely missing uh, in, these, in this one page RFS. Right? And, and I think, you know, it's great to have competition, but if you better define and, and, and put at least a better technical definition around that, it's going to help the industry come up with uh, a high degree of, a better degree of reliability, which then helps de-risk some of these perceptions around, yeah, is the tariff viable? Are there, uh, you know, will these plants last for 25 years and so on and so forth? So I think that's kind of one aspect of uh, of, of this whole thing around risk mitigation. I think the other issue is that we got to realize, as Dr. Haldia outlined, project sizes have grown from 5 megawatts under the JNSM phase 1 to now under ISTS bidding, you're looking at 250 megawatts and upwards if you're going to connect to PGCL network. The commissioning schedule for those projects for a 5 megawatt project in 2010 was 12 months. It still remains 12 months, right? And, you know, Anybody on this panel or in the room, if they've done land acquisition, they would know what the challenges are. Uh, even the government, when it is trying to do solar parks, takes about three years to get a solar park done. The Reva took about three years for the park to be ready, right? You're expecting a developer, a lot of them are like very, very small companies because the net worth criteria is very low. Be allowing them to bid with no land, no transmission permits, and then you're expecting them to work with government agencies to get all that, while the delay and the onus is on the developer. So it's kind of inequitable right now. And I think, you know, either we need to give, recognize that larger projects need more time, and increase the time between allotment to COD from this 12 months to something which is more uh, manageable, maybe two years, maybe 30 months. That's what it takes in, uh, in international markets to develop projects, if you look at US, Europe, you know, even countries like Middle Eastern countries, you get about three years to commission a 250, 300 megawatt project. Or you need to then allow up developers to upfront buy land and get interconnect permits, which are transferable, right? Because then you have, and this used to happen in the wind industry, by the way, in India where you had wind developers like Suzlon or, or Gamesa kind of building the projects and then, you know, getting in investors at a day before COD and kind of transferring the asset. Now, unfortunately, in India, on the solar sector, we don't have the right to transfer evacuation approvals. And, hope, you know, under this new uh, CRC regulations, again, the transfer rights are, have, not, have, have been disallowed. And I think... If you, you have to do one of these two things if you're looking at larger size projects, which I think you'll have to look at. Nobody's going to do five megawatts now anymore unless you're doing distributed small, uh, you know, tail end uh, of the feeder line kind of projects. So to me, these are the two big uh, issues in the sector in the, in, in the short term, uh, which, we, which is kind of low hanging fruit. It can be resolved if there is a will to resolve this, right? And if you do that, I think it frees up and, and kind of starts to de-risk some of these uh, projects. I mean, we've got a unique situation in India where if you do state projects in Karnataka, Telangana, Andhra, in our experience, and Vikas is there from Yes Bank, he can testify to this, people commission projects without actually owning land, right? And so you're in straight, because you've got land conversion rules which take time. This is just government rules, and so you're, you're straight, straight up in violation of uh, your loan covenants. And everybody knows this. Right, but the system allows this to happen. We should we should fix it. I mean, this is what our humble submission would be. Thank you.
Thanks very much for your comments. Those were like really, uh, you know, uh, to the point, really in-depth comments and uh, kind of the issues that actually are pinching the industry. So thanks very much for that. Uh, we'll try to come back to uh, discuss more on that. But uh, right now, I want to move on to Donald from uh, EIB. Uh, earlier, Dr. Haldi also mentioned that the domestic lenders may not have the capacity to finance all the projects that are being built or that are expected to be built, let's say, in the next uh, 12 to 15 years. And that is why we need to have access to external financing. And uh, obviously, EIB plays a major role in that, uh, has started to play a major role in this. And uh, what I want to understand from you is, how is the how are multilaterals different from commercial banks in their uh, understanding of the market and their risk appetite? And uh, uh, then, what is that they can bring to the table for the Indian developers? Thank you very much, and, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time this morning. The EIB. Um, is is a, an unusual beast. We're uh, a multilateral that was set up in post-war Europe and, and faced a similar set of challenges to the, those challenges that we're facing now. And I read just yesterday that we need uh, to find half a trillion dollars to finance renewable energy targets uh, worldwide just to meet the COP21 targets of 1.5 degree increase in temperature. And if we don't meet that, if we don't find that half a trillion dollars, we will face legal and insurance costs and damages of five times that, so two and a half trillion. So we're, we're left with a fairly stark uh, equation here. We have to find a very large amount of money. And as Dr. Haldia quite rightly said, we're not going to just get that from the commercial banking sector, and especially a banking sector which is struggling with non-performing loans. Not, not everybody, but <laughs> there are some, some very large uh, issues out there. And so the, the commercial banks have a very limited appetite. So okay, then we turn to the multilaterals. The multilaterals, are, I guess most people, and my children included, think of the multilaterals as there to distribute government money. And I, I actually think that's, that's a very incorrect view. I, I talk about our role as mobilizing private sector finance worldwide to address problems in local areas. So the EIB in India, we, we have a, a two billion portfolio. Where did that money come from? Well, it did not come from the European Union. It came from the international capital markets. So we use our uh, AAA rating to go out and raise money from pension funds, from um, uh, all sorts of investment vehicles who need AAA uh, bonds in their portfolios. And so we raise it globally and bring that money to invest in India. Um, the, the other key aspect about uh, multilaterals is that we don't have a profit objective. Which, which is different to, to our, our commercial brothers. Um, that means we try and address or, or can help to address the cost of funding. And I'm not sure how many people in the room would be aware, but the proportion of the cost of finance, quite apart from the, the cost of their technology and uh, of the construction, simply the cost of the finance is a very significant proportion, between 30 and 40 percent of the total cost of the project. So reducing the cost of the finance is an important way of de-risking projects. So I think there, that there's an important role for, for multilaterals. Basically, you know, when we talk about de-risking, in our view, it, it's not about taking away risk or reducing risk to, zo to zero. It's about allocating risk to those who are best capable of taking it. And, and these are generally very important uh, considerations in IPP structures, in, power, in the independent power producer structures, which require very complex uh, contractual frameworks with multiple parties. And the importance of multilaterals is that we have very deep experience and, and obviously working alongside our, our commercial bro brothers um, 
we are very used to these kind of complex structures. And we, we bring a, a, a very thorough due diligence to uh, the appraisal of these exercises so that when other people get involved in the financing, they can be confident that the project is going to work. The, uh, just as an indication, in our uh, PPP portfolio, the ratio of non-performing loans is 0.3%. 0.3%. So it's a very low uh, number of projects that we invest in that actually fail. So that, that acts as a catalytic effect. And that's one of the, the major roles that we see ourselves. I think a second important role of the, the multilaterals is that when things go wrong, and inevitably they go wrong in, in, in projects, when things go wrong, we are not pushing to wind things up. For us, our interest is in making sure that the, uh, the projects succeed. And we have the patience to deal with those. And we have the contacts to make sure that things go right so we can work with our colleagues in the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Environment, or whoever is, is concerned to make sure that projects go well. So I think those are the, the, the kind of major things that we have to offer. Obviously, uh, we have uh, uh, fairly limited resources, so we're putting in about $500 million uh, a year into, into India. That's a drop in the ocean. But So we, we choose the sectors in which we're going to get involved. And it seems to me that the, the government framework, one of the most important things, the government frameworks around uh, the solar mission and the offshore mission have, have been instrumental in, in putting India at the forefront of renewable energy. And I was just reading yesterday that India will have the largest uh, solar farms within two years in the world and, and already is the fourth largest player in offshore wind, uh, in onshore wind uh, worldwide. So I think these are, these are all elements to de-risking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just one follow-up question on that. So, I mean, you obviously have a lot of experience, experience in uh, lending globally. So, are there any practices, you know, or uh, uh, measures that are being followed globally but have not been taken up in India? There, there is one initiative that we're um, pushing in Europe. It, it's not being applied here. We call it Project Bonds. So. The idea is that, that most uh, PPP-type structures are financed through a mixture of uh, sponsor equity and commercial debt. The, the projects that we're pushing is the, that these SPVs, the, the solar large grid scale, uh, grid scale solar farms, will issue bonds in their own right and with uh, the support of the EIB providing a guaranteed tranche those bonds can be more highly rated than the um, project sponsors uh, and even perhaps than the, the national sponsor, the, uh, the sovereign ceiling, so that they can achieve very high rating and can attract um, international uh, finance that is, is looking perhaps for rupee, um, rupee debt, rupee returns, but without the uh, the limits of on on the credit risk side, so we can improve the rating and then attract other sources of finance. We call that our project bond initiative. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I would like to bring uh, Ronald, uh, Ronald into the discussion now. So we discussed. I mean, Donald mentioned that we need to reduce the cost of financing to reduce cost of risk, but it kind of goes round and round. You reduce the risk, and then the cost of financing goes down. So, based, uh, I mean. Uh, Unicari is one of the biggest uh, reinsurers around the world. So, could you share with us what are your clients concerned about? What is their main worry? And what are the standard or, let's say, global best practices around uh, insurance or reinsurance these days? Yes. So, yeah, thanks for the question. As Munich Re, yeah, we are active in in whole insurance industry, but uh, we have also a team. It's called Green Tech Solutions, and we focus since uh, 10 years only on renewable energy and so what we do we we had 
we are not concerned about the traditional risks such as natural catastrophe or earthquakes, fire. These are, of course, also in our business. But as green tech solutions, we analyze the new renewable technologies, especially solar technology, and uh, try to identify risks that are there. Uh, there are new risks and they are specific to such an industry and uh, that are insurable. So, so in solar, we, we have done this now for the last 10 years and the, the, one of the main risks that, that we are worldwide insuring is the so-called warranty risk of solar. So when we analyze solar projects, we, we see that they are, let's say, easy and fast to set up. The, the, in the operational phase, the investors expect almost zero O&M costs. Of course they are, but comparably low O&M costs. And this all makes it a very attractive project. Uh, but it's all based on the assumption that this piece of equipment, this panel, the solar module, is actually performing for 25 years uh, maintenance-free, almost. And this is a very unique uh, warranty that actually the, the manufacturers issue. So the manufacturer issues a 25 years technologically performance warranty and uh, most investors, lenders, and governments, they, they take it as granted that this warranty actually performs. So uh, we see here one of the large advantages of solar, the low O&M, but also one of the large risks, because what if this just isn't so after 10 or 15 years, because maybe the manufacturer has gone bankrupt? Then a relatively medium-sized defect in the solar, a serial defect in the solar panel can kill the whole project. From the severity of the risk is on the same level as a natural catastrophe. So it, there is a low risk, uh, there's a high severity, maybe a low risk that this happens, and this is exactly a kind of risk that should be transferred to an insurance company. And uh, this is where we have developed and placed a standard. Meanwhile, it's, it's a kind of standard insurance worldwide, which ensures this warranty risk of solar by backstopping the manufacturer's warranty uh, to a, yeah, with an insurance company. So, so there we see, especially in India, we see now a lot of modules coming from China and and then, then we always have the question, what makes a, a module bankable? And, and I, I like also from Ashok, he mentioned a lot about IEC tests, certifications, quality assurance. This is all very important. And, but in addition, we see that a bankable module carries a, a reliable warranty insurance. This is one of the key metrics that a bankable module should have. So. So here, the lenders, also the regulators or governments, they, they can make sure that uh, this warranty risk can easily be mitigated just by insure, just buying modules that carry such a warranty insurance. And we have seen now in India, some of the lenders are actually aware of that, some are not yet. Uh, and also some of these government tenders, they look into it, but some are not. And uh, there has also, there needs to be also some kind of more detailed information because there are also insurance products which, which they, they have a warranty insurance but they are more tailored to protect the panel supplier. So if you really look at your panel and the insurance that it carries, you should just ask the question, how much insurance limit, how much financial capacity in, in US dollar is really allocated to your park and your park alone. So it should not be a, some kind of shared limit, but you should really make sure that the warranty insurance which you buy uh, carries a specified, assigned, dedicated, we call we say a dedicated limit that belongs to you. So, and, and it's probably the, the wrong choice to to try to buy a cheaper module that does not carry such a warranty insurance. That's probably the wrong 
a place where you should uh, save on cost. Yeah, this is one of the mm, yeah. one so, of so the main uh, risks that we that we uh, address. Yeah. Thanks for that. And uh, you also mentioned that it, uh, you know, it, it's a big. Uh, it, it is a cost that needs to be priced into the project. So, how do how does one go about it? I mean, uh, how how is the product price? I mean, is it an upfront fee? Is it an annual fee? What amount of you know cash flow should be diverted to such a mm. such such a mechanism? So, the underwriting of of such an insurance is is actually done via the module supplier. So. The, the module either comes with a good warranty insurance or it does not come with a good, good warranty insurance. For the buyer, it's maybe not 100% transparent what is the additional cost of that insurance. In fact, it could be maybe absorbed at least partially by a good module supplier. So, so it's more or less if you are, in a, if you just negotiate it in a way with your supplier, then a, probably it's a no-brainer that you just take it and, and, the, and the supplier will probably absorb some of the costs. And in terms of numbers that you are asking, uh, we look at numbers of less than one, probably half a percent of the module costs that are then coming with, that, that we would ask from the supplier, yeah. but not from the project owner. Of course, this relatively small amount of 0.5% does not cover now 100% of the project. That's why I say you have to ask how much actually now belongs to you in terms of dollar amount. So if this dollar amount is like say 10% of your project value, maybe, and you want to have 100, then you can, then you have to really address, approach the insurance company directly to top up such a cover. Okay. Well, th thank you very much for those comments. Uh, I'm sure it's very uh, helpful for a number of our participants over here to understand how reinsurance works and uh, what are the limitations and uh, the needs for top-ups requirement, uh, top-up requirements uh, as one progresses through it. Uh, I would like to bring Manu into the discussion uh, from the other end. Manu, uh, I mean, we have uh, talked a lot about how the tariffs have gone down, the risks are increased, have uh, increased or changed. And, uh, but, but what I want to ask you is that, uh, you know, previously uh, there was concern when we talked about renewables, there was a concern that they don't have enough capacity. They cannot add uh, enough uh, modules or enough uh, wind turbines in a year. But that kind of proved, uh, the industry has proved, uh, proven that to be wrong. And now the industry is building 10, 20 gigawatts of projects every year. Then the next concern was that it is not cheap enough. So now that the industry is, you know, actually producing electricity, which is cheaper than the fossil f cheapest fossil fuel technologies. What is the next thing that needs to be looked at for the industry? What is the other you know, elephant in the room which the industry is missing? I think um, to answer your question, a lot of emphasis is placed on um, the sort of low renewable energy base speeds, 2 rupee 44 paisa, 2 rupee 43 paisa. But when we talk to a lot of stakeholders, especially in states and people, let's say SLDCs or transmission companies. So their major concern is around how do you actually balance the grid um, with um, ensuring that enough renewables is actually injected into the grid. So I think the transmission risk, um, and we have also seen um, Seki has actually postponed its 10 gigawatt of bits in the last uh, two weeks, so it's all over. So, but I, uh, and I would just like try to um, take an example from the work that we are doing in South Africa and so the, we did a similar work for India and then we went to South Africa and what we have seen in South Africa, it's brilliant. I mean, the level of transparency is, um, so they, I'll just give you an example. For every substation, they say that only 500 megawatt could be connected to this grid. And that's the kind of granularity and transparency that they um, show in their sort of plans and, and investors, developers and everyone could easily see and then decide whether I actually want to uh, build my plant near to this substation. Um, I would also like to um, take clues from what um, Dr. Ghosh, Haldia, uh, and Mr. Rajshri mentioned. They mentioned about a very important thing called size. Uh, we have sort of graduated from megawatt to gigawatts. And, and I think we cannot afford to have that same kind of daily dalliness um, that we are used to um, in, the, in, in the power sector. So, um, and also, um, I would also like to touch upon the sort of policy uncertainty, right? I mean, there are a lot of stuff around safeguards duty, anti-dumping duty. I mean, GST has been implemented one and a half year back and still 
there's a lot of clarity which is required from the, especially from the, I think, MOFs and there is a ruling in ARR, advanced ruling committee that uh, the, it, should it qualify as a work contract or should it qualify as something else? Will it attract 5% or 18%? So I think it's, it's time we sort of uh, move away or sort of settle dust on these fronts because these are not very difficult issues to deal with. The most, the, the difficult issues in, in my, and what we actually look at the council is, is a sort of curtailment risk, right? And this comes a lot when we talk to especially equity investors. I mean, it does not come up um, with our discussion with lenders, but mostly um, people who will be at the line of fire when this risk hits them. So uh, I would also, um, will slightly touch upon this um, instrument called an uh, Ronald and Miss, um, Shri, Mrs. Shri and Dr. Haldia also mentioned about financial products and de-risking mechanisms. So we are working on this thing called Grid Integration Guarantee. Uh, what it does is it basically, uh, it's an insurance product, that's how we are envisioning it. Um, it basically ensures um, your renewable energy developers and investors against the curtailment risk. I mean, the, the, the details of which need to be fleshed out, but I think it could be a very powerful concept uh, when we are not just looking at 175 gigawatt, but also looking beyond 2022. Um, because, and Donner also mentioned about efficient allocation of risks. So I think when it comes to efficient allocation of risks, risks um, there's a lot of risks which needs to be allocated to suitable parties, which in this case would be the developer and the DISCOM will not, they don't have any idea like which transmission line is working and which line is not. So some of this risk need, need to be allocated to transmission companies. Uh, when we talk to transmission companies, their major argument is that we don't have that money to, to sort of give any guarantees to anyone. So I think that's where the government could sort of step in, either central government or state governments, and there has to have, um, and which actually goes to the next point, that f we have to move from pure lending to risk mitigation. Okay. The eye readers of the world, they cannot just simply, they, it's what they mostly do is pure project, pure, pure project financing, right? So there, there's a need to identify specific risks and then allocate those risks to specific parties. And uh, sorry, uh, sorry to jump in, but um, I, I also believe that you, uh, I, I mean, your company or your organization has done quite a bit of work on these risk mitigation tools and how to make effective utilization of public funds. Could you touch upon that as well? Yeah, so I, I already mentioned green integration guarantee, which will be sort of, we will um, come out with the first draft at the end of June. Uh, but we've already, um, last year we worked with International Solar Alliance and so we, what we developed, uh, we developed a product called Common Risk Mitigation Mechanism. Um, it's a task force headed by TCX. TCX is a currency hedging fund um, based out of Netherlands and Terawatt Initiative. So the task force um, um, comprises of Council on Energy, Environment and Water, Terawatt, Terawatt Initiative and um, TCX fund. So this Common Risk Mitigation Mechanism, it basically eventually, it deals with three risks. It deals with off-taker risk, it deals with forex risk, and it, and it deals with political risk. I mean, political risk does not exist in India, but eventually, um, forex risk is 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 quite a big risk. Isn't land a political risk? Sorry. Isn't land a political risk? Acquiring land. <laughs> I think that's a tricky question. Land <laughs> is not a political risk. Political, but mostly, what the definition of political risk in the financial circle is mostly around um, the governance. The when government try to nationalize certain private assets and when it's an issue around currency convertibility. So those are the risks we're talking about, but it's not, it does not exist in India. Um, so basically, stuff like this, right? I mean, Forex is, is a big, big risk. We don't know the developers who are getting their loans in dollars, what kind of buffer have they built in their bids um, for currency. So the two things that I want to say, like which the audience in this um, room um, can, take a, can take those um, learnings. One is that, we have graduated from megawatt to gigawatts and the attitude across the value chain needs to change and there is a clear need of identifying specific risk and then allocating them to specific parties either uh, by operational or pol policy measures or through some sort of financial guarantees okay. so. thank you very much yeah. and uh, uh, now i would like to bring in uh, you know vikas into this discussion and Vikas, I mean, you being the lender and uh, a local lender, 
there are a lot of uh, things that you need to look at and specifically talking about the RBI regulations. I want to know, you know, the RBI regulations on uh, bankruptcy code on 90 day and 220 day rules. Have they impacted your uh, financing operations or, you know, how have they and how? Uh, thanks. Thanks, Shantanu, and uh, uh, thanks for having me uh, on this panel. Um, so, of course, I mean, uh, you know, RBI has been uh, pretty ahead of the curve in terms of when we see, uh, when we compare the previous uh, eras and the current eras of uh, project financing uh, you know, happening in India. So, uh, the, the new regulations brought out by RBI, uh, they, of course, uh, uh, affect and they actually strengthen the system also but they affect the current uh, you know uh, the current way the way, the way uh, you know the banking sector has been operating uh, in the country so uh, 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 from a from a bank which is actually uh, which is currently the fourth largest bank uh, in india and with a balance sheet size of more than uh, 45 billion dollars um, i can i can definitely say that these steps which rbi has taken actually strengthen the system and uh, brings in line uh, some of the practices that actually should have been followed uh, during the last 20 years, but um, you know, never. I mean, sorry, then uh, late. Uh, so, uh, so basically, um, uh, so yeah, of course, RBI regulation will definitely affect uh, the banks, but not more than maybe the next one year or two years. Uh, I, I would just like to brief about uh, Yes Bank's role. Uh, how we have played a key role in uh, you know in this sector renewable energy sector and how um, uh, we have seen changes uh, across uh, this journey of uh, last 5 to 7 8 years um, you know uh, when we started financing this uh, in this sector in 2010 when we were relatively a very very young bank we started in 2004 only and 2010 we were only 6 years old in the system and we saw opportunities in this sector that you know this is going to be a sunrise sector for india considering the challenges that the developed world and developing worlds are facing uh, you know how india will be positioning itself maybe going future going in future so i mean we we started as uh, early as 2010 and uh, during this 5 7 years uh, uh, yes bank has been uh, first in quite a number of uh, steps that have been taken to develop this sector yes bank was the first bank to actually give a, a financing commitment to uh, the government of india for this sector of around 5000 megawatt we have already achieved 90% of that target uh, it was for a five year period we have achieved this target in less than four years so um, uh, we we were the first bank to actually came out with a green infrastructure bond uh, during that time uh, it was a it was a pioneering thing that time and of course it was followed by all the other stakeholders and it's a it's a good development for the country uh, we came out with the bonds uh, which were more than uh, you know 165 million dollars uh, that time and we are we're still harnessing uh, the benefits of that bond uh, raising uh, we were also the first uh, lender in the country who uh, to take up the uh, credit enhancement uh, facility for a solar bond uh, it was backed by adb uh, lines but uh, it actually gave some impetus to the developers who came out with the project level bond as donald was mentioning that you know how to develop spv level uh, you know bond financing and bond programs so of course, India still lags in a lot of thing in developing all these alternate instruments like Invit or uh, you know or, or the bonds or IDFs. IDFs, of course, are there in the market now, but uh, we still need to see more and more development. There are only, uh, I think, around 15,000 crore of exposure that IDFs have been able to take, whereas the requirements are are in lakhs of crores. Uh, uh, similarly, for the credit enhancement lines. Uh, or the uh, the takeout financing from specific institutions like IFCL, we need to see a lot of uh, you know risk taking appetite from these institutions, which is not happening. And what's your view on this? I mean, do you see these mechanisms, you know, IDFs or uh, credit mm -hmm. enhancements or invits increasing in the next two or three years? It should definitely increase because of the size, the quantum which is required. As Dr. Haldia mentioned, that you know the six lakh crore is required, whereas the till date infrastructure exposure of banks is only ten lakh crore. So it is 60% of the exposure that in, you know, banks have taken in these 25 years. Uh, you require this in, in the next two or three years, which is next to impossible, uh, I would say. So of course, these mechanism which has been introduced in the last three, four years, I think these needs to be definitely uh, pushed up. Uh, uh, maybe uh, some sort of operational efficiencies needs to be built in the system with a financial backup uh, 
to be play, to be in place so that these institutions are actually ready to take up more and more risk they have more and more appetite um, we saw a good development uh, in the current year budget minimum finance minister announced that they will work towards uh, you know bringing the bond market uh, uh, you know uh, uh, high you know equivalent to equity markets that we see in the country um, the rating criteria is maybe uh, you know uh, softened a bit but i think the work uh, is still need to be seen i think this year is going to be a, a turnaround year with this respect that uh, how how the government is actually shaping up the market to take up the next two years of uh, financing Okay. Talking about government initiatives, I mean, there were there were a few initiatives for the renewable industry, power industry. I mean, yeah. one is Uday, which is the biggest one, and yeah, then yeah. there were things on green corridors. Yeah. So, have these initiatives by the governments helped you in uh, providing, uh, you know, affordable finance to companies uh, investing in the sector? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, two, three bigger steps that were taken. Um, you know, during this uh, journey from 2014 onwards, uh, one was the one was a very big step of uh, you know identifying central uh, undertakings like NTPC and SECI uh, to come forward as a as a mediator between the discoms and the developers, which has been a very very good step. Um, you know, these two entities are very very well rated uh, in the domestic market, and they they command a good amount of uh, you know uh, uh, respect in terms of uh, their credibility so i think this was one major step the other was uh, you know relaxing terms around financing for renewable energy including you know psl classification for some of the so smaller projects in renewable uh, uh, all these steps were in fact good uh, steps that, which encouraged a lot of public sector uh, you know banks to come forward uh, and finance a lot of projects. Um, of course, Yes Bank did play a role in getting first uh, to the financing and then you know, getting other banks into the picture by way of our business model, which is basically to underwrite projects and then syndicate uh, most of our exposure, which actually enhances the exposure which public sector banks are able to take. So, uh, so these uh, steps were good, but of course, as you mentioned, green corridor, um, and I would add one more point of uh, single window clearance. You know, these two aspects, I think they are still um, uh, kind of uh, on the paper right now. I, 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 we don't see much of progress what is happening in, the, in those uh, areas. Green corridor, I think it's, it's fairly getting delayed. Uh, um, you know, I think a lot more should happen and a lot more communication should happen from the government, from the states, what, what they are doing in terms of investment and physical progress of those uh, corridors. Uh, similarly, single window clearance, we still see that you know, we are running uh, from one office to another for project clearances. Um, uh, the current bid which was supposed to happen was not happening because of the ISTS non-clarity. This, this, this should have been, uh, in fact, this should have been taken care of well before uh, the time that we are currently in. So I think single window clearance is one, one more important aspect where uh, I think all the stakeholders can work together in ensuring that, which will actually reduce the implementation time to a, to a lot more low level. Yeah. So uh, two quick questions and the, uh, you know, I'm a bit conscious of time as well. So one is that Yes Bank has pioneered a lot of things. I mean, mm -hmm. being the first one to do a lot of things. Is there anything that we can expect in the next year or two? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we are working uh, very keenly, uh, we are working very deeply with the government uh, machinery. Uh, I mean, uh, I think most of the people are aware that we are, we are, we were the knowledge partner to uh, MNRE, to the government of India during the first RE Invest, which actually uh, opened up a lot of avenues for uh, you know lenders like us to work with the government. Uh, so uh, I can tell you that all the new new ways of uh, doing business, uh, including blockchain, including uh, you know uh, new technologies like blockchain and new ways of uh, you know like uh, demand side management of electricity like EV and how they. How, how the things are shaping around EV. Yeah. We, yes, Bank is very, very active in that. And I, I, I mean, I can safely say that, you know, you will definitely see within the next one year how Yes, Bank is actually shaping up its lending business around EV and blockchain. Oh, that's great. Uh, look forward to seeing that. Yeah. And uh, last question is on uh, IPOs. I mean, a lot of companies, uh, especially IPPs, have um, announced their intentions of uh, launching IPOs this year. So quick comment on, is this a right time to do an IPO? Uh, uh, there, there is always a right time. There is always not. I mean, there, there cannot be a right time. All, you know, also, so um, the markets are one thing which uh, you, nobody can time it uh, pretty well. Uh, but I think uh, we've seen a lot of activities around M&A in, uh, in the last uh, one and a half years. A lot of consolidation has already happened. A lot of players have grown big, uh, and uh, I think for them it's the right time to actually open up their balance sheets now.
Okay. Great. Thank you uh, for that comment, Vikas. And uh, uh, I'll, uh, I think we have time to take just one or two questions. And if you have any pressing questions, please do let us know. If there are no questions, then I'll ask the panel a few questions. Oh, there's one. <laughs> Yeah, a good overview from the, all the panelists, uh, right from uh, Ms. Rajasri. And while we are having a very good overview of the major sector, and there, is, there are good policies, the tariff identification determination is happening, and the Vega scale projects are happening, we seem, of course, I don't know whether this is out of context for this panel, we seem to be lacking the focus on the MSMEs because we need a lot of products coming from the down the line while panels, inverters are there for big players. But then we need a lot of uh, small, small items that are needed for the projects. That needs the focus on the MSME sector. I don't know what the government is doing for that, if there is any focus for MSMEs and how they can come into the picture, at least to support the sector. If some thinking can be done on that. I think that makes some sense. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, so, Vikas, do you want to quickly add anything to that? Yeah, just, just uh, I mean, uh, I think he raised a very valid point. I mean, MSME plays a very big role in the country's. Uh, uh, growth towards any sector. Uh, for renewable also, I think there are a lot of uh, independent players who are performing their task in, in ensuring that the, that the sector achieves its targets. Uh, I just wanted to make a point that, you know, in this, in this current year budget, there have been a, a very big announcement with respect to the changes in definition for MSME, with respect to the priority sector lending classifications. Uh, I think we still, we still yet to see the uh, that come out in the paper from government, but uh, I, there was a, there was definitely an announcement made by the finance minister with respect to the MSME uh, definition, which is I think moved to around 250 crore of revenues now, which which brings in a lot of MSMEs under this purview of priority sector lending. Uh, the public sector banks would definitely be I think taking this up in terms of ensuring their PSL targets. Uh, please. Sorry, I'd like to just uh, step in and, and address that point because I think renewable energy and, and solar in particular is presenting a remarkable opportunity for SMEs. There's a new set of emerging uh, technologies uh, uh, ranging from uh, the single solar light bulb attached to a bat battery right up to uh, solar water pumps, uh, solar mini grids, solar clinics, solar schools and so on. And, and our view, and we're doing some work with the International Solar Alliance to develop a, an off-grid uh, solar financing platform that will be piloted in India, hopefully next year, uh, then more broadly in the region and, and in sub-Saharan Africa. And the idea is that we, we see there's a, a, a huge audience for solar entrepreneurs. So the, these are people uh, working at the typically in rural communities, uh, who can develop businesses around these new uh, emerging solar technologies, which are hugely energy efficient. Um, you know, a solar fridge uses one half of the power of a normal grid connected fridge, if I can call it that. So um, these are, are real business opportunities. And I, and I think that's what's going to drive the investment here, that, that when the small MSM, MSEs can actually see a, an opportunity to make money, to make a livelihood out of this. And, and, and that's a, an area of very importance yeah, th for us. Thanks very much for bringing that up, Donald. I mean, we kind of missed the small uh, distributed segment. I would also invite yeah, Dr. Haldia to please share his comments. I mean, are there any products which are specifically targeted to this segment? Uh, when we are having a debate and discussion on the solar, we are talking about the megawatts and not the gigawatts, and therefore, the focus on the MSME is not there. But if you look at the way the things would unfold in the times to come, away from these ground-mounted, uh, the utility level, the large megawatt projects, the entire map or the canvas is for MSME. If you are looking at the rooftop in the residential localities, and if the rooftop is linked to the housing schemes or the housing loans, 
there is a plethora of opportunities opening up for the M for the MSME. Even if you look at now the at the residential sector when the rooftop is being installed, there are they are all MSME. And second thing is there are I mean there are balance of plants equipments which are going apart. 86 presents are being imported from China of the total requirement, but the balance is coming from the domestic suppliers. And there, it is the small and medium-sized players who have been supporting. And thirdly, for the o requirement, it is the small and medium-sized players who can create that, uh, create that niche and market for themselves to provide that o facility, because it's not highly techno, uh, techn technology oriented as of now. And as rightly said uh, by, uh, earlier, that as the new technology evolves, all those new technology, when they are commercially tested, would be at a small level. And that would be a platform for MSME uh, to launch themselves. Yeah, thank you very much for those comments, uh, Dr. Haldia. And uh, I mean, obviously, there are a lot of things to discuss on financing, and not, that, not all of these things can be covered uh, in a panel. So the idea of this panel is to bring out you know, some of these specific issues or some of the most uh, pressing issues currently so that you can then take it up with the panelists later on in the discussion. So I hope you will uh, keep interacting with the panelists and uh, otherwise. And uh, with that, I would like to bring an official close to this discussion. And uh, very nice uh, to have you over here. Thank you very much. So uh, I would like to thank all our speakers, respected moderators, uh, for that wonderful session on renewable energy financing. So before uh, we bring the session to an official close, I would uh, request moderator, sir, Mr. Shantanu, to give a token of our respect to the speakers. So we begin with Mr. Manu Agarwal. <coughs> Mr. Sujay Ghosh. Mr. Ashok Haldia. Ms. Rajasri Ray. Mr. Vikas Bansal. Dr. Donald Cannon. Mr. Ronald Sastrawan. I would now request Pallavi from the Exhibition India Group to present a token of appreciation to our mod respected moderator, sir, Mr. Shantanu. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for convening here for this beautiful session. 